Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us for tonight's launch of a new series we're putting on um, bi-weekly, every second week. It's the ABC of Marxism with Ian Spencer. Tonight, we're looking at the concept of workers as the grave diggers of capitalism. Thank you, Ian, for joining us. Thank you, and good evening, comrades. Today is the 141st anniversary of Karl Marx's death. Um, why Marx, by contrast, is a little over a year old and began by looking at uh, the contemporary relevance of the study of the works of Marx and Engels. Since then, we've covered a wide range of topics from the monarchy to the current genocide perpetrated by Israel in Gaza and throughout Palestine. Now, following requests from some comrades, we've returned to look at the fundamental components of Marxism. The aim is to present something accessible to those with a basic knowledge of the works of Marx and Engels, but also form the basis for discussion for those who've been immersed in left-wing politics for some time. The aim of this series is to show how politics, philosophy and political economy are integrated because that was Marx's method and indispensable for a full understanding of Marxism. From the outset, why Marx has argued that the Marxism is relevant as relevant today and possibly more so than when Marx and Engels wrote the Manifesto of the Communist Party in 1848. If anyone wants to understand the reason for the growing inequality in Britain or how imperialism has led to the current barbarism in the Middle East, the ABC of Marxism is a good place to start. As we'll see, um, Karl Heinrich Marx was born in a part of Prussia which was most heavily influenced by the Great French Revolution of 1789. His parents, Herschel Marx and Henriette Pressburg, were both the children of rabbis. Henriette was originally from Holland and married Herschel in the synagogue at Nijmegen. Napoleon's declaration of the emancipation of the Jews in 1799 meant that Herschel Marx was able to train as a lawyer and enjoy a moderately comfortable life in Trier where Karl was born. The defeat of Napoleon in 1815 meant, among other things, that the regressive feudal laws of Prussia, including discrimination against Jews working in the public service, were now enforced. Herschel Marx converted to Lutheran Christianity in 1824, changing his name to Heinrich. Their nine children, including Karl, were baptised shortly after. Henriette converted in 1825 and remained religious and probably covertly Jewish, as well as being more comfortable speaking Yiddish rather than High German. Heinrich Marx died in 1838 from tuberculosis, as did four of their children. The young Karl also had symptoms but recovered. Uh, the picture shows an 1836 lithograph of students in Trier outside the White Horse Tavern. The detail of the 18-year-old Marx is the earliest picture of him. Um, Karl wanted to study philosophy and literature at university, but his, at his father's insistence, he was enrolled at the University of Bonn to study law. Correspondence between Karl and his parents is full of entreaties for him to look after himself, drink less, not smoke, keep clean and not spend so much. So profligate was Karl in Bonn that he was obliged to transfer to Berlin, where he became part of the young left Hegelian circle. Hegel, at the time, dominated philosophical discourse in Germany, but had become an establishment figure. Marx com completed his doctorate on the difference between Democritean and Epicurean philosophy of nature in 1841 at the University of Vienna, under the supervision of Bruno Bauer, who had been a student of Hegel. Karl had been good friends with Jenny von Westphalen since childhood and also enjoyed a close relationship with her father, with whom he would enjoy long walks and discussions about English literature, particularly Shakespeare. Whilst Jenny's life had been overshadowed by Karl, she was a published theatre critic, writing reviews for the German press on the works of Shakespeare. As the von in her name suggests, Jenny's family were of minor German nobility, but were also related on her mother's side to Scottish nobility, leading Karl Marx to be arrested in 1854 after pawning some of Jenny's silverware. The police were unable to believe that a swarthy, unkempt-looking man could be legally in possession of silver bearing the crest of the Duke of Argyll. Jenny and Carl lived in terrible poverty for many years in London, until eventually they received a legacy from Jenny's family. Marx first met Friedrich Engels in 1842, but by then Carl had fallen out with the Berlin young Hegelians and was cold towards him. Later, when they became firm friends after meeting in Paris in 1844, Engels often wrote to Marx addressing him as Moore, a reference to his complexion and their common love of Shakespeare's Othello. Engels was born into a prosperous, devoutly Lutheran family in Barmen, now part of Wuppertal in uh, Prussia. Um, 
They owned textile mills in Balmain and Salford. The company Ehrman and Engels only ceased production in 1979. Friedrich Engels, like Marx, immersed himself in the study of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, whose works have informed their methods throughout their working life. But unlike Marx, Engels was not allowed to go to university. His father intended that Friedrich should enter the family business. In 1841, Friedrich undertook his military service in the Prussian artillery. Later, he put his military training to very good use in the revolutions of 1848, where he served as an aide-de-camp to August Willich, a professional artillery officer, Prussian of artillery officer, who resigned his commission having become a Republican and a communist. Willich later commanded a free, free corps during the revolutions of 1848-9. After the revolutions, uh, Willich uh, sought refuge first in England and then later the USA, where he eventually commanded a regiment fighting on the Union side. Engels retained a lifelong interest in military matters and wrote extensively on the subject, which is how he earned his nickname, the General. This was part of the division of labour between the two revolutionaries. While Marx pursued the study of political economy, Engels published significant works in his own right, such as the Peasant War in Germany, which analysed the Protestant Reformation in terms of class struggle. Engels also wrote many articles in Marx's name to help support Marx financially. Like Marx, Engels too was constantly reproached by his parents for his dissolute lifestyle, as well as his revolutionary political stance. Friedrich's avowed atheism and communist perspective, uh, and that he arrived at that independently of Marx, led him to being sent to Salford to play his part in the family firm. It was here that he met a radicalised Irish woman, Mary Burns, working in the mill. It was Burns who was Engels' guide around the poorest parts of Manchester and Salford, leading Engels uh, to initiate the study of political economy, um, which it, uh, the study of political economy by Marx, as well as Engels' own important work, The Condition of the Working Class in England, which was published in 1845. Engels' essay, Outlines of a Critique of Political Economy, was submitted to the German-French yearbook and impressed Marx, leading them to meet again in 1844 in Paris. They subsequently settled intellectual scores with the young Hegelians, including Bruno Bauer, in their joint book, The Holy Family, which was published in 1845, and later, The German Ideology, which, despite being abandoned to the gnawing criticism of the mice, laid out much of what we now regard as the Marxist perspective. Other unpublished work, the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, would form the basis of their worldview for decades to come. They also contain valuable insights into the view that Marx and Engels had on human nature. Contrary to the assertions of the Stalinists, such as Louis Althusser, principal theoretician of the French Communist Party, there was no break between these early works of Marx and Engels and the later mature work of Capital. More importantly, the 1844 manuscripts, which only became available to an English-speaking audience in the 1960s, showed how the revolutionary transformation of society was about the creation of a world in which people would become truly human a realisation of the species being of humanity. This too was a topic which would be a lifelong study for Engels, as we see in his study of anthropology, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, published in 1884. The early development of capitalism in England had provided a powerful impetus to the centralisation of state power and industrialisation. The Germany of Marx and Engels was still substantially feudal, the various small kingdoms ruled over by princes, electors and kings had proved unable to withstand the impact of the French Revolution of 1789. Indeed, the possibility of overthrowing the petty feudal impediments to full capitalist development meant that many Germans were supportive of the French Revolution. Hegel is famously quoted as seeing Napoleon in Jena, where he was an academic, and wrote, quote, I saw the emperor, this world's soul, riding out of the city on reconnaissance. It was indeed a wonderful sensation to see such an individual who, concentrated here at a single point, astride a horse, reaches out over the world and masters it. Beethoven, too, was an admirer. His third symphony, the Eroica, was to have been dedicated to Napoleon, but this was retracted after Napoleon crowned himself emperor. Hegel, too, reappraised, reappraised his enthusiasm for the French Revolution after the Reign of Terror. As we see from the map, Trier lies in a part of Germany occupied by the French and most influenced by the Code Napoleon. It's just here. Um, but Germany was also dominated by Prussia. Marx and Engels supported German unification, but not from any love of Wilhelm I or Otto von Bismarck, 
but as a progressive step towards a unified republic, even though Wilhelm became Kaiser after the defeat of France in 1871, which was the most momentous revolutionary year in Marx and Engels' lifetime. Any support for German unification was irrelevant against their support for the Paris Commune of 1871 and the first attempt to bring about a dictatorship of the proletariat. This phrase, which we'll come back to, is a testament to the classical education of Marx and Engels. Dictatorship is used in the way it had been used in ancient Rome. The Roman Senate could appoint someone, such as a general, as a dictator for a limited period to achieve a particular task, such as the defence of the Republic. In the Commune, the workers of Paris and the National Guard took power and instituted a radically different type of state, one in which all officials were subject to recall and paid no more than those they represented. The Commune held out for two months, one week and three days before being bloodily suppressed. From that moment, the bourgeoisie became aware that they could lose power, particularly in Germany, where as a result of industrialization, a growing proletariat was giving rise to a socialist movement, which would eventually become the Social Democratic Party. Bismarck, as Chancellor of the German Reich, enacted anti-socialist laws from 1878 to 1888, as well as making concessions to workers in the form of social insurance. It sometimes comes as a surprise to people, well, when I say people, I mean sociology students reading Marx for the first time, that Marx offers no definition of social class, nor indeed of revolution. But this shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Marx and Engels' thoroughly dialectical view of the world grasps such cat categories not as a checklist of attributes, which we see in bourgeois sociology, but in its dynamic relationship with other classes. History, too, is different for Marx and Engels. Drawing on Hegel, history is seen as a dynamic movement towards freedom, one in which new forms of society develop within the old as they decay, and class struggle provides the motor of history. The picture, by the way, um, Cromwell and Charles I by Paul Delaroche, never actually happened in real life. Uh, Cromwell never actually peered into the bloody coffin of Charles I. It was um, Paul Delaroche's uh, kind of romantic image, as it were. The typical sociolo sociological caricature of Marx is that he argues that there is only one, there is only two classes, the bourgeoisie, the owners of the means of production, and the proletariat, those who have nothing else to sell but their labour power. In fact, throughout Marx and Engels' work, there are innumerable references to different classes, such as the peasantry, landlords, the petit bourgeoisie, or small property owners, and also innumerable gradations within such classes, whether that is the declasse lumpen proletariat or the privileged sections of the proletariat whether they are privileged because of their position relative to poorer sections, such as Irish workers, or because of their possession of skills and incorporation within the trade unions. In 1940, the Marxist historian Christopher Hill published a short book called The English Revolution. In it, he argues what is most always referred to as the English Civil War was in fact a bourgeois revolution. That is, it was the sweeping away of the last feudal impediments to the development of capitalism in Britain. In so arguing, he draws on the insights of Marx and Engels. Some have objected that Cromwell was not a capitalist, nor many others in the parliamentary army, but that is to miss the point. Feudalism had been in decline for hundreds of years before 1640. The transition from feudal production where serfs worked and were tied to the Lord's land and st had steadily been replaced by an agricultural proletariat of paid labourers. Peasants who, who grew what they needed and sold the surplus were replaced by an agricultural production of commodities for sale on a world market, which in turn required control over those markets and a navy capable of being the powerful instrument of imperialism. In the case of England, the wool trade play, played a particularly important role long before the industri industrial manufacture of woolen and later cotton textiles. This illustrates the way that history is not merely a gradual development from immature forms of capitalism to mature forms, but is rent by upheaval and revolution. It also illustrates the other important aspect of dialectical philosophy, the, the interpenetration of accident and necessity. Instead of seeing the English Civil War as the result of the interaction of individuals operating according to their own interests, Christopher Hill, drawing on Marx and Engels, can show that the basis of capitalism was already present. The fact that Charles was unskilled and at times foolish is an example of accident in history. A wiser king might not have been decapitated and presided over a more peaceful transition. 
But the fact is that the driving force for that transition was already there and unstoppable and the necessary feature, the development of capitalism. In this case, the bourgeoisie consist, constituted itself as a revolutionary class that was prepared to overthrow the landed aristocracy and its ideological support from the bishops of the Church of England. Proletarians, such as they were, played a part, whether as foot soldiers on one side or the other, and perhaps more importantly as a driving force behind more radical sections of the new model army. Note, however, this was a class that at the time was un not able to take power or even articulate its demands easily. We see it in the levelers of the Putney debates, the Putney debates, calling for the extension of the franchise and the abolition of the House of Lords. We also see radicalism expressed in religious terms, such as the digger, Gerard Wynne Stanley, writing about the sin of private property. The point is that the bourgeoisie was a revolutionary class that took power by force, using other sections of society as conditions dictated, only later to suppress the radical elements symbolised by Cromwell, declaring himself to be Lord Protector. What is at stake is the transition from the feudal mode of production to a capitalist mode of production based on commodity production, which in turn throws up different relations of production between free labour working for a wage rather than a feudal serf rendering compulsory military service or handing over a part of his produce to his feudal superior or the church. Later, this happened even more graphically in the French Revolution. The term revolution is so widely used, it's worth remembering that for Marx and Engels, that what was at stake is both a transition from feudalism to capitalism and the future possibility of a revolution in permanence by which the proletariat can take power. As an aside, it's also worth remembering why Marx and Engels use the term proletariat rather than working class. It's another feature of their fully classical education. The proletariat in ancient Rome was the class of landless labourers who had nothing to sell but their labour power. The bourgeoisie is derived from burgess or burger, city dwellers, a class between the peasantry and aristocracy, at one time subordinate, but in Marx's time increasingly the dominant class, despite the continued existence of others. The revolutions of 1848, which I've already mentioned, uh, took place throughout Europe and were predominantly bourgeois in character. That is, their aim was to strip feudal privilege from aristocrats and kings in favour of the sanctity of private property and the contract. Often, they demanded the inclusion, the, the, the demand included the establishment of republics to replace monarchy. Marx and Engels supported this as, for them, the republic with guarantees of freedom of press, movement, political organisation and parliamentary representation based on universal suffrage constituted the ideal conditions for establishing a revolutionary party of the proletariat. They also observed that in 1848-1849, the petit bourgeoisie, small property owners, would support the revolution only later to support reaction to prevent workers from taking power. In all their writings on politics, Marx and Engels stressed the importance of this balance of forces and the possibility of counter-revolution. Just as Cromwell suppressed the radicals in the army, so Napoleon was only prepared to fulfil the bourgeois revolution to a point. Bonapartism has become a byword for stopping a revolution before it can reach its logical conclusion. They argue consistently that the organisation of the way in which the surplus is pumped out of the working population is decisive in shaping the religious, legal and ideological forms to help keep the working population under control. Force is only used as a last resort. The importance of class consciousness, therefore, is crucial to understanding revolution. Unlike the transition from feudalism to capitalism, the socialist revolution would have to have a conscious transformation, even, through, even though the consciousness develops under revolutionary conditions. Note, too, the difference between a revolution from below and a coup d'etat from above, which Marx commented on extensively in his analysis of class struggles in France. An industrial revolution usually requires an agricultural revolution to provide the surplus to release large numbers of workers to work in factories. For example, the dissolution of the monasteries in England provided a powerful impetus to the development of capitalist farming of cash crops for the market. Sometimes this is referred to as primitive accumulation. Instead of the home being the basis of production, as in peasant society, instead there is a separation between home and work. The development of steam power 
and machinery develop, dramatically increase the productivity of workers. At the same time, the skill of the worker is subsumed into the machine. Early atmospheric steam engines required considerable skill from engineers, but the mass production that Engels observed in the cotton mills of his family firm, the rate of work was dictated by the machine. The chapter on machinery and capital is one of the most readable and powerful in the book. The factory concentrates workers in one place. Capitalist production separates worker from his or her product, but this also provides the basis of the separation from what it is to be truly human. Workers' actions are directed by the pace of work, which is now in the hands of the capitalist. At the same time, the product of every worker is also commensurable with the product of every other. She or he becomes an abstract labourer. Work, instead of being creative and something that life-enhancing, becomes something to be dreaded. At the same time, the proletariat becomes a universal class. The abolition, the abolition of which is the abolition of all classes and the final realization of a truly human society. The proletariat are the grave diggers of capital brought into existence by capitalism itself. Um, Marx and Engels were fully aware of divisions within classes as well as antagonism between them. These divisions were explicable by examining class relations in their historical specificity. At one point, Marx says, a Negro is a Negro. Only under certain circumstances does he become a slave. A cotton spinning machine is a machine for spinning cotton. Only under certain circumstances does it become capital. These social relations appear superficially as natural relations. Marx talked about this as commodity fetishism, where, for example, the value of a commodity appears to be a natural feature like its weight or colour, which obscures the exploitation which lies at the heart of the production of a commodity. The fact that a worker appears to freely enter into a contract obscures the fact that the worker has little choice but to sell their labour power in order to avoid poverty or starvation. Systems like social insurance have been won as a concession by workers, but even so, unemployment for most people means poverty, and the gains that have been made can also be lost, as we've seen in recent years. Just as there are divisions in the proletariat, so there can be divisions within the bourgeoisie, as we saw graphically illustrated by the Brexit debate. So does that mean that these divisions constitute separate classes? The fundamental distinction between, is between capital and labour. That constitutes the defining feature of capitalism. Just as capitalism developed inside declining feudalism, the basis for socialism is developing within a capitalism in decline. Capitalism has created the potential for abundance. The proletariat, unlike in Marx and Engels' day, now constitutes most of the world's population. The interconnectedness of world trade also means the, the interconnectedness of workers around the world. Another crucial feature of the crisis is the crises caused by capitalism, such as the climate crisis and the reduction of large areas of the world to crushing poverty, forcing millions to migrate. This cannot be solved by the bourgeoisie. Revolutions happen when um, classes are faced with an almost insoluble problem. Of course, we can continue to descend further into barbarism if the proletariat fails to act or is defeated. But from a Marxist point of view, classes exist in themselves, determined by their relation, relationship to the means of production. But it is when they become a collectivity that they become classes in the truest sense, for itself. Whatever divisions exist in the ruling class are as nothing when they feel under threat. We've seen the recent development of a worldwide movement in response to the barbarism in Palestine. At some point, the proletariat must act to solve the existential threats we face. The only solution is a worldwide socialist society. Workers of the world unite. Thank you. <laughs> Wow. Um, could you um, stop sharing screen, please, comrade? There was a lot packed into <laughs> your 20 minutes <laughs> opening. Jesus. Comrades, if you have any questions or comments, please click raise hand and I'll bring you in. Um, I think you really succeeded in trying to a, bring it to today I, and explain what they actually meant with their concepts and um, using today's 
situations etc but also as you um as we try to do um mix you know their their how their biography found reflection in their politics and vice versa um uh, just a quick couple of questions then uh to you to talk us through it because you touched on a lot of stuff i think we might have to re-listen to this uh in a in a bit of a in a slower <laughs> slower way because there's a, a lot of stuff in it um so if comrades have questions or something you know or haven't quite understood something please click raise hand and and ask so starting from the beginning again you you mentioned that some people believe there was a young marx and an old marx and there was a gulf between them the young marx was hegelian etc and then basically something happened and he he dumped all of that he dumped the theory of alienation for example they say can you explain that kind of division a little bit and what's behind it who is claiming that there is a division between the young and the old one and why they would they do so to your knowledge well it's interesting that um the, the person who most identified with that is is louis althusser of course in the, the, the french communist party and it was also um althusser was writing at a time when the Soviet Union was in existence. Um, if you have a situation, I mean, well, you know, as it, the focus here is on sort of basic concepts in, in Marx and Engels, but if one considers the impact of the Soviet Union and the fact that the revolution was effectively defeated and therefore could only enter into this sort of stasis and become, if anything, a kind of anti socialist form, how does one explain? Um, the continued existence of things like alienation in the context of the Soviet Union. Um, if the conception of socialism is is somehow merely um, that there isn't private property, then the Soviet Union can could tick that box. You know, the, the property was effectively owned by the state or property. Um, what then do we make of all this discussion around human nature? Um, because it, it it was not only in um, the economic and philosophic manuscripts, but it was in but it, it, it's relevant through through Marx and Engels' work. Uh, and in Capital, there's a reference to human nature. Uh, it's contained in a footnote, but the whole point, of course, was that they were trying to um, that society should be moving to one in which humans could be truly human. Um, one couldn't make that argument about life in the Soviet Union. Anyone who actually lived there, uh, it, it was a pretty dreadful place to live um, and had terrible consequences for, for those who, you know, whether it was the famine caused by forced collectivization or whatever. So it's the important thing then was to simply take out all that stuff, all that stuff about the very nature of what it is to be human in favor of a kind of um, rather simplified version of, of socialism based upon the fact that the means of production wasn't owned by individuals. It was owned collectively by the state. But it wasn't even collectively. I mean, everybody knew in the Soviet Union that the the, the ruling elite, if you for want of a better phrase, lived better than everybody else. So um, how do we then explain why work was just as miserable, if not more so, in the Soviet Union than outside. So there was a, a, a feature within Stalinism which sought to remove all that. Um, and it was interesting characters like Erich Fromm or, and the Frankfurt School and whatever, that, that tried to retrieve, if, if you like, the, 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 hum, the humanitarian, the humane aspects of Marx. You could go further and say it was an an ontological project. It was a, a, about the very nature of what being to be a human. Both Marx and Engels were, um, as I say, students of Hegel, and they were also, of course, students of Ludwig Feuerbach. And, and, and it was Feuerbach that, of course, uh, made the crucial break with um, Hegel's idealism. Um, idealism in this context doesn't mean what we tend to mean you know, we say always oh, a bit idealistic, meaning he's got high flown ideas about this, that, or the other. But idealism, in the sense that um, mind, in a sense, is is primary. 
it finds its ultimate expression, of course, in the idea of God. Um, but for Hegel, the idea uh, as a, as a, as, a, as an an ultimate uh, a notion of of a world spirit uh, as something which was determining uh, was of course the major factor. What Marx and Engels did was, as they put it, st stood Hegel on his feet, um, and and you can illustrate the difference between idealism and um, materialism by comparing, for example, Engels' magnificent essay, uh, The Peasant War in Germany, with that of uh, Max Weber, the sociologist. Max Weber presents the idea that in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, that it is the idea of capitalism, the, the idea of the Protestant ethic that brings capitalism into being. So the idea is primary. And for a lot of people, this is actually what we see all the time. The idea that you have, we just have to change the way we think. Mm -hmm. Whereas from a materialist point of view, the way that we think is shaped by our material conditions. Um, and so when Engels does a much better job of analysing uh, the Protestant Reformation, he does it in terms of the class struggle. Uh, and, he, and he shows how uh, Martin Luther's perspective is, is shaped by the development of capitalism in Germany at the time. Now, when I say capitalism, obviously I'm not talking about modern industrial capitalism i'm talking about precisely what was taking place in england as well you know the idea of farming being production for the market and a world market at that and and really martin luther's ideas were the expression of of a growing bourgeoisie mm. by contrast uh, thomas Münzer, uh, who was sort of the, the radical end uh, of of uh, the the Reformation was putting forward ideas that would be appealed to, to the very poorest, not strictly speaking proletarians at that stage, but you know landless labourers, people who have been dispossessed constantly by the enclosure of uh, of lands by rapacious feudal lords and that kind of thing, um, and so. For, for Marx and Engels, it's the material factors that give rise to the ideas of the time. And, um, well, by contrast, you know, here's Max Weber, a person who had a hand in writing the uh, constitution of the Weimar Republic uh, and, and was a thoroughgoing liberal, um, trying to argue that it was Protestantism that brings capitalism into being. It's a bit of a problem for him, really, to explain then why it comes into being in Japan or a whole range of other places. Um, of course, he would have argued, I suppose, that it wasn't um, he wasn't arguing for a causal relationship, but he just didn't get away with it that easily. Mm. So it's a crucial difference between the radicalism of, of materialist dialectics and the conservatism of Hegel's idealist dialectics where you didn't mention the base and superstructure but that kind of touches on that which i don't think marx wrote a lot about but a little bit in it so the base the material base informs you know church state how the state is organized etc and you have to understand it from from that way it arises out of it and of course it then also does that superstructure then also feeds back into the base and can perhaps change it but it is a it isn't one direction only no uh, and and they, they're constantly influencing one another and the um the the, the tendency has been to see the, the kind of base and superstructure metaphor as being just about how um the material base affects the way we think but the whole point of course is that uh, i think marx puts it in the terms of that ideas once they seize hold of the masses also become a material factor mm -hmm. and because after all human beings are part of that material substrate mm -hmm. um, and uh, and this is also the, the the point about consciousness is that whereas um uh, capitalism through our ideological forms in the shape of religious perspectives such as that of uh, um, Martin Luther or whoever else um, a socialist revolution would have to throw up 
a kind of a fuller class consciousness uh, and that poses a problem how do, you know if, if as i'm arguing um the the basis for socialism already exists and it exists in the form of you know, almost a super abundance i mean we, we could quite easily reduce the working week to 10 hours very very quickly um under different circumstances but when you when you consider just how many jobs that are being done which are completely pointless and make nothing of any any worth including all the armaments industry and everything else um Can I ask, yeah. sorry go on no that, 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 that okay ask something about the um the lack of a blueprint uh in marx and engels which has i think troubled generations <laughs> you know what exactly is socialism supposed to be how are we supposed to build it you know how are we going to get it and you're saying also there was no clear definition of classes um and you know so and you get it i mean you still get it and people think oh yeah yeah i'm i'm a capitalist if i support the current structure i have no idea what it actually means and stuff but we get an idea I mean, there weren't wasn't a clear definition perhaps but we have a we have an understanding roughly i mean you explain it there weren't there's two big classes but there are also lots of classes in between but these are the two big poles really aren't they and oscillate other classes oscillate in between um those two those two forces so in your in your um you know when talking about the grave digger which is the sort of title of of this session the grave digger that i cap capitalism produces the proletariat the working class um can you can you explain this a little bit more how it then tries to break other classes how it tries to um you know win over also parts of the the bourgeoisie and in the form of angles of course it has won over a capitalist a proper bourgeois it, it's it's an important point because the um there's been a tendency in the past on, on in left-wing groups to say somehow the only people who can really be communists are sort of horny-handed sons of toil and uh, people who work in productive industries as opposed to non-productive industries. I mean, as the series goes on, we'll look a bit more closely at productive versus non-productive labour. From the point of view of Marx, of course, um, productive labour is surplus value producing labour. It's those workers who are being exploited. But what does that mean about, I don't know, teachers or nurses or whatever at no point does Marx say that these are somehow not workers on the contrary um that all of that is 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 part of um still I mean they're still have nothing else to sell but their labor power and still uh, potentially identifiable with the proletariat um the, the fact that some of them are relatively privileged is is significant but it, it's it, it doesn't stop the, the potential for the for the class relations and also what, what we've tended to see of course is that actually many of the 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 more privileged sections of, of of the working class have in fact been among the most radicalized um and so the idea that uh you you, you can't be a socialist if you if you've got more than fifty thousand pounds a year or whatever it's just nonsense and it and it's and it's the nonsense that belongs to bourgeois sociology rather than the marxism um productive and non-productive labor uh would have been, probably have been discussed more fully if capital had ever been completely finished uh the original intention for capital was that it would be six volumes and only later when obviously Marx was getting on a bit did it become truncated to three and of course he only finished one um so uh, one of the volumes that would have been written was on wage labor and would have probably have developed all the relationships between what we might think of as productive and unproductive labor um but the um the the, the crucial thing here is that that section of the of the what we might regard as non-surplus value producing workers, teachers, doctors, whatever, um, uh, are also an important part of the workforce for the workers. They may not be productive from a capital capitalist point of view, although of course some are and some aren't. Doctors can work in the private sector. Uh, the, 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 the sale of uh, a service is, is still the, the sale in the sense of a commodity. 
Um, but, it, but it's still an important part of the reproduction of the working class as a whole, and still important, therefore, for workers and, and, part, of, and part of the proletariat, potentially. When I say potentially, um, the proletariat here is something which exists as a, as a nascent class, a class that's still waiting to come into being. Um, from that point of view, it is as a saying towards the end, it's a class in itself, but it's not a class for itself. It hasn't come to realise its historical destiny of, of doing away with all classes. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we have seen, obviously, we, there have been attempts, Russian Revolution was most successful in that sense, French, uh, the, the Paris Commune. But um, no blueprint then, let's talk about that briefly. You know, there's, there's no... There's no definition really but of what exactly socialism is supposed to be. And that has created problems for a lot of socialists, you know, in, in trying to explain it. Um, how would you how would you define it, explain it, and explain why Marx and Engels didn't write a blueprint? They, they tended to, I think they tended to avoid it, but they they, they were never soothsayers. They were never um a, a, attempts at um predicting things and where they did predict things they, they weren't necessarily particularly accurate mm -hmm. um so what, what would a socialist society look like you can't really know mm -hmm. uh, in advance the only thing the nearest you get to it is a kind of sketchy outline in the critique of the gutha program um where marx talks about they would come up i mean it's completely out of date because he, uh, he was thinking in his time of instead of money we could, for example, have labour certificates. You know, let's imagine you've you've done your bit. Uh, you, you've been the bloke that's heroically gone down the drains and sorted and cleared that out, and or whatever you've done, or you've been working in a care home or whatever. And you take your labour certificate and you can exchange it for whatever goods you need at you know, a common storehouse. And, so, and you see, you can see how immediately how things have moved on a bit. Um, in, uh, and, and of course, this isn't money. It doesn't circulate. You don't, you know, you don't get a circulation of labour stickers. You just go and take your, take what you need. And there comes a point, he argues, that, that actually, um, where, where people will just get so used to the idea that you you do your necessary labour because society needs that, uh, and in exchange you can take what you need. And of course, immediately, I mean, when I used to try and put, put this to to students. They would say, well, what, what, what stop people just taking everything? Well, hang on a minute. We, we've already presupposed abundance. Um, how many televisions can you watch? How many iPhones can you have? How many cars can you drive? You know, I know people do struggle with their water bills, but water is, to all intents and purposes, almost free. Um, I've never had the overwhelming desire to fill the house full of water and buckets everywhere and fill the bath up just in case and... The, the point is, where you have abundance, you don't need to do that. So food could be free, transport mm. could be free. I mean, that discussion changes a bit with in climate change, doesn't it? I mean, we can't just have everybody have as many cars as they want and stuff. I mean, that that is that put limits on something that perhaps Marx and Engels weren't quite so aware of that that would. I mean, they they knew about uh, de ecological degradation and and that kind of stuff, but they probably didn't think that the planet would go down the plan within 150 years of them. It, I mean, no. Uh, and um, the, the, the point of them, though, of course, was that we can actually make rational decisions. Um, capitalism doesn't make any rational decisions. I mean, it's just based upon uh, the immediate short-term gain of profits. So, therefore, when, uh, you know, when the government, our government, decides that they're going to carry on extracting north sea oil because we don't well we, we could lose out in some way um well, ignoring the fact that we just can't burn the stuff um but if the only thing that matters is profit then, then that's what will happen and that's why there needs to be a, a a rational and democratic approach to the question of uh of 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 climate change of 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 uh, of the whole approach to human need and yet you see all sorts of other irrationality i mean a lot of farmland in britain for example is quite marginal 
Um, and, and it's been won from the land by destroying miles and miles of forest, which had previously thickly covered the land. Um, there's no reason why some of it couldn't be reinstituted. And, and the same goes in lots of other places. Um, so a, a rational decision based upon human need is what Marx posits in the critique of the Gotha program. Of course, he does it in a, an old fashioned way of, of the time. But you could imagine how it could happen today. I mean, we could just simply decide that we need to not just plant a few more trees, but reforest great swathes of land in order to help deal with the climate crisis, to help deal with the constant flooding and so on. Um, we don't need, not everybody needs a car. I, I personally don't feel I need to own one at all. If I could just borrow one, it'd be all right. I only need one now and then. Um, and, and so it goes on. Um, but in in the critique of the Gotha program, what it comes down to is this idea that you could be a, it, it's, it's framed rather quaintly as you know, a, 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 um, a critic in the morning and a free to um, do whatever after dinner. And I mean, the, the point is, you, you move to a society where uh, the, the, the detailed division of labour disappears. I mean, people can do the work that they need to do. There's going to always going to be actually certain jobs that are going to have to be done. But otherwise, most people can then devote themselves to what is truly conducive to themselves. And uh, everybody, and, I think it was Lenin, um, was it uh, saying, you know, if if everybody participates in the running of society and becomes a bureaucrat in that sense, hmm. you know, then nobody's a bureaucrat. If everybody takes something, takes over, helps with the running of things, then, you know, there are no bureaucrats yeah. because we're all it. And actually, when you think about the National Health Service, although I've argued in lots of places that there's, there's nothing particularly socialist about the, the NHS. It, it came into being out of the the, the poor law infirmaries and the, and the charitable hospitals and so on. And it, 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 but it, it does have something at the heart of it, which is a, a good indication of what a socialist society might be like. We don't all have an equal amount of health care. I mean, my daughter has cystic fibrosis, so she needs really rather more health care than most. Uh, and, and she's free to have as many tablets as she needs or whatever else and it doesn't need um and, and it doesn't bother anybody else um and the same goes with food or whatever i mean if you somebody needs a bit more food they they get a bit more food and if if you have an, a, a state of abundance it doesn't bother anyone um and the same goes for it for any other set set of needs you you I mean, there will always be a shortage of the villas on the Adriatic or that kind of thing. But, you know, why couldn't we share them or take it in terms? Or, I mean, humans do all the time. It's called going on holiday. You know, you, the difference is you only you only go for a, two weeks of the year. It's two weeks of the year when you get to feel really human, when you can just do as you please, um, rather than all year round. Yeah. And, uh, from that point of view, Marx then argues that work, labour, becomes man's prime want. You know, we 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 want to act on nature um, to 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 satisfy ourselves, to to satisfy our needs, and in changing our in changing nature, we change ourselves. And um, Marx and Engels had a great interest in anthropology and. Uh, 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 and 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 we're interested in pre-class societies or communism um you know, that's sometimes primitive communism it's not a very good translation um and in 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 pre-class societies there seems to be ample evidence that where there is abundance there was no war there wasn't the kind of routine destruction of of the environment where there was scarcity, there would be war and there would be the destruction of the environment, whether it's on Easter Island or wherever else. But centuries, it seems to be that the, the, the evidence that we can see shows that there were long periods when there was no class society, no money economy, and people managed perfectly well, thank you very much. Indeed. Um, one other question um, before bringing comrades from the floor is this, this the um, concept of dictatorship of the proletariat, which people here 
and many many think and some socialists think that as well that means you have to that's a particular stage after capitalism perhaps you know after the revolution dictator what proletariat means the dictator rules over the the other classes with an iron fist there's going to be blood on the walls etc but and this is a really good book by Hal Draper that that's not the case really isn't it it's it's this concept that's only mentioned seven times or eight times I believe by Marx and Engels and perhaps you could explain how they're mentioning it it, it, it relates back to what I was saying about the idea of a, a Roman dictatorship it's something that exists for a, for a brief period of time um growing up as I did in the 70s and 80s uh, one of my earliest political memories is is of the murder of Salvador Allende uh, anyone who thinks that workers can take power just using normal parliamentary means and and, and bring things about peacefully um will likely to be disabused of that fairly quickly as ruling ruling classes don't generally like to give up their privileges quite so easily and from that point of view <clears throat> um there may need to be a period in which we say well um for a while uh we're not going to necessarily let the, the, the bourgeoisie reorganize regroup and take retake power and if that means that we um rearm we arm the working class in a, in a people's militia in order to keep uh, the possibility of the use of a standing army under control um, in order to ensure that the ruling class doesn't uh, take back power and, and and drag all the revolutionaries off to be shot him instantly which is usually what happens where there are revolutions that fail um, then for a brief period there would have to be a, a period in which the working class is in a dictatorship over the former bourgeoisie um, and its agents of one sort or another. Now, whether we continue to use the term dictatorship or proletariat, I'm, I'm not. I don't really mind. Um, but I think it's naive to suggest that, I mean, um, that, that that something wouldn't have to be done to keep the former ruling class in check until such time as there are no classes. Until you know, you can do away with money. You can do away with um, the state and all the rest of it. You don't need to do away with it. Eventually. If everybody's administering society, then the state, as Marx puts it, withers away. Um, so dictatorship was used as, it, 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 as a, Marx and Engels as classicists used it. It was a brief period of time when you have to, you know, to achieve a particular purpose, the bringing about of socialism. And, uh, but but it, it wasn't at all what dictatorship has come to me now, which is one person or one group of people in constant charge with no rules whatsoever and then do what the hell they like. And it it it, it just means rule, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, the, the concept just means rule of the working class. So, <laughs> I mean, Chartists did, had this this really nice saying, and but I agree, which, which was basically, you know, peacefully if we can, forcefully if we must so we are prepared we have a workers militia we are armed and if the ruling class the former ruling class the capitalists don't agree with the new <laughs> order of things then you know some will have to fight back of course um but you know if if they don't then fine you know we're not we're not going to close down everything we're not going to close down every single newspaper every single party or whatever uh all all depends isn't it? it's a tactical question yeah, i mean uh it, it in a way the, the the stronger the revolution is the the, the 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 less repressive it has to be yeah if if you have the overwhelming majority of the people behind the idea of a transformation to a, a peaceful society where all production is to meet human need then the odd person who suddenly decides that we, we would just like to reinstitute capitalism or it would just be a, a, a source of pity <laughs> a mild derision perhaps and hardly hardly need to suppress them and let them publish what the hell they like um it the, of course the experience of the soviet union when the revolution was effectively defeated by 1919 um meant that you know you 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 have in the end, the Bolsheviks reigning in democracy as well. So you, the, the, the Bolshevik party doesn't have any factions after what, 1921? And, and the, the, 
the, the Soviets uh, had effectively ceased to be the democratic institutions they most definitely were at the, at the start of the revolution. Mm. That's probably a, a subject we haven't touched on uh, tonight, um, is the, the need for internationalism, isn't it? I mean, it's the Soviet Union showed you can't have socialism in one country. It just won't work because, you know, you get 18 other, I don't know how many other, I think it was 18 uh, armies invading um, that, you know, red beacon and trying to put an, put an end to it. So as you describe, it quickly turns into something else unless we can internationalize that. How, how will that work in practice? Or did, did Marx and Engels deal with that at all? I don't think it's well. I, I think it's fair to say they they, they didn't. Uh, I, I think Engels is interesting because, of course, he he writes uh, about insurrection and saying that you only really carry out insurrection when you really know what you're doing, when you when the balance of forces is is in your favour, because the likelihood is you're going to be up against a far superior enemy. You know they've got the army, they've got the people who are who've got the surveillance, they've got everything. Uh, and what we've got is vast numbers of people, most of whom have no military training, have no capacity to, to, to accept the sheer weight of numbers. And the fact that ultimately, of course, soldiers and all the rest of it will, 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 will come over to our side. But we'll have to, or otherwise it's just going to be another bloodbath. Um, Does that make sense? That... It certainly does. And I'll shut up <laughs> now and bring in comrades from from the floor. Um, Malcolm first. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hi. Yeah, it's very simple, <clears throat> actually. Um, at some point in your talk, you you said, "What does it mean to be human?" Um, but you didn't say what it did mean to be human. So I. <laughs> How that came into your quite complicated analysis. Well, um, what Marx and Engels were up against really was uh, it, it was something that had come from Feuerbach, the idea of man's species being. How would humans be if they could be truly anything they wanted? Um, most of our lives are taken up with just working for a living or whatever else, and we're bound up with a whole series of ideas. Um, not of our making, which is you know, people are inherently greedy, acquisitive, rapacious, um, and and a, a kind of notion that you see in bourgeois philosophy of a of a war of all against all, as in Hobbes or whatever, and and therefore requiring a certain amount of repression as the price we pay for a civilized society. Marx and Engels would have argued that's not how humans are at all. Human nature for Marx and Engels is about um, well, in, it's inherently collective. It's inherently um, uh, social. You don't find human beings on their own, and if they if they are on their own for any length of time, they usually become quite ill. And if the if 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 humans uh, on those rare occasions where where humans have survived, as it were, in the wild without other human contact, they've been raised by animals or whatever, they don't even fully develop properly. Um, the, the, Developing as a, as a as a social animal is 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 what we do, and the other aspect of it is it it's, it's human as as worker in the sense of humans that, that meet our needs by our labour, uh, and that changes us as well as nature. So the angle the example Engels uses is the opposable thumb, which develops as a as a result of working upon nature and making tools and so on. You could use other examples. The human bowel is is actually quite short compared to that of a a, a, a largely omnivorous hominid. And by contrast, the human brain is very large, um, and that's a quite an energy hungry organ. And the only way you can really satisfy that is through cooking. Uh, you know, so the the ability to use tools to make fire to cook things means that human beings can nourish themselves in a way, or hom early hominids could could nourish themselves in a way which d effectively influenced their own evolution. How would humans be if they could be truly human? It's a it's a it's a question that you you find in from the Bible onwards, 
um, and in a lot of other philosophical perspectives as well. Can I just say something? Mm. Because I, sorry, uh, Jared Diamond wrote a, an essay, I think, from a long time ago now, called The Man's Biggest Mistake, in which he argued that uh, becoming the farmers and herders actually destroyed the whole society, really. And uh, I was trying to find somebody to refute that essay, and I haven't managed to find somebody refuting it. So, I mean, what, as far as I'm concerned, what it means to be human is basically to live how hunter gatherers lived, because everybody thinks you're mad if you say that. But I mean, if you look at it, that's probably how humans, because that's after all about 96% of humans, modern humans' existence was in that situation. So we have been living the last 10% or something since the last 15,000 years in a situation that's completely um, unnatural for us. Uh, so I, I mean, I don't know how that feeds into to the whole business of Marxism at all, but it does seem to me that you can see uh, this attempts by people to, to sort of return to their, they go camping, they have, barbecues, they go fishing, they do, they go hiking, they want to be in nature, they want to do all sorts of things, all of which might might lead you to believe that that's what, how people really want to be. And of course, if you propose it, you just say, people think you're completely mad. But I mean, I, I wonder if that's what Marx and Engels were trying to say, if they wanted people to be human, which is, as far as I can tell, is what you're saying in a way. Well, in part, I mean, uh, Marx Engels would have argued that, yes, that's right, of a lot of human history. And that's the part of human history as well, where there wouldn't have been the kind of violence that we see once you get into pastoral societies and that kind of thing, where you get, you know, fight wars over grazing land, water, uh, and so on. The, I think, though, that what Marx and Engels would add to it is to say, We've got past the, that hunter-gatherer stage. We can actually have more than that because we can have abundance plus. You know, so, I, I mean, rather than me having to spend all day trying to find a, a small animal to eat and, and trying to catch it and the rest of it, I'm then free to go to the theatre. Uh, I'm free to do all sorts of things. I'm, I'm free to read books. I'm free to... Um, you know, play with my dog or whatever I want to do um, and, and and that's the point it's, it's not a, an appeal to go back to a pre, pre, primordial stage it's an appeal to keep the best of what we've got um, but make it sympathetic to nature because you know, we're part of nature and we can't do without it does that make sense? You're mute, Tina. Sorry, <laughs> Pamela, you're next. Sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, all right, thank you, um, Ian. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, one of the things, just a few observations and, and questions. Uh, one of the things which struck me was uh, the development of capitalism involved clearing workers off the land where they were um, able to earn a living um and the 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 highland clearances and in britain the enclosures and uh eastern europe um i think was later and one since corbyn i've never really studied zionism before but i've been reading a bit of history and one of the interesting i think interesting things was that the early some of the early zionists had been very much influenced by a collective socialistic ideology in, in Russia and Poland. And the Jewish workers and the Pale of Settlement um, were, were organized in the Bund, which was a, a, a Jewish union. And those ideas came over with them of those who, who came to Israel and settled in the kibbutz movement. Now, the kibbutz movement was just totally cynically used uh, by by the Zionists. But those people who established, established them first 
had genuine I ideas of socialism. And um, that was one of the sort of crazy contradictions uh, of Zionism. You know, how could, is it just socialism just for Jews? Uh, what about everybody else? Um, and there's, um, there's some very interesting um, reports of the ideas of these comrades um, who were comrades from Russia and Poland who ended up in Israel. And the book called, called Yiddish Land by some, some French, a um, couple of French communists, went to Israel and interviewed these old Jews who had come over um, from the 30s and afterwards um, about their views. And it's very well worth reading. So I was thinking about basically that workers that used to live collectively um, in the villages in, in Eastern Europe, from what I gather. Um, and, and also you could see that in the highlands um, before the clearances and uh, the way the clans were organized. Also some clans were organized more collectively than others where the chieftains were very oppressive. Um, so that's sort of one idea about um, workers living collectively in an instinctive way, um, because that was the best way uh, to live. And then there's this discussion about Cuba, which I don't really know much about, but I, as far as I understand, that there isn't um, a genuinely workers' socialistic uh, organization there. Um, uh, so was that the two main, two main things? I think that's yeah, that's that's the two main things. Thanks. Uh, um, Marx and Engels' uh, early encounters with Zionism uh, was largely in the figure of Moses Hess. Um, Moses Hess was a was an associate of of, of Marx and Engels early on. Hess died in. Uh, 1875, I understand. And Moses Hess was an early advocate of, as it were, Labour Zionism. Um, Marx and Engels regarded him as a crackpot, quite frankly, um, and, and, and didn't have much regard for the idea at all. Um, the the, the Labour Zionists that settled in um, Palestine um, may well have been motivated by all sorts of high ideals in terms of uh, collective work within the kibbutzim but in practice what zionism did was exclude palestinians from work um so of course there are different periods i mean the, the, the late 19th century period of, of zionism was people like rothschild supporting um colonies in um palestine uh, often at considerable expense um to try and have orange groves or whatever plant. Either way, and, and initially by by actually buying the land, well, they weren't buying the land off ordinary Palestinians from the from the Felahin. They were buying land from the Effendi, the landowners. So, you know, uh, Rothschild buys a big chunk of Palestine from um, the local Effendi, and then says to all the Felahin who happened to be on the land, uh, working under very poor conditions quite frequently. Now get off because we want it for Jews. And um, they may well have been organized in a kibbutz, they may well have had all sorts of high ideals uh, around socialism, but what they ultimately still meant was the expropriation of the land um, for themselves. And of course, the Zionism as it subsequently developed was uh, unlike. South Africa, where the native population was was exploited, here in 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 Palestine, uh, they were simply excluded at every opportunity. And the, the Zionist trade union movement uh, worked very hard to exclude any kind of solidarity with Palestinians, uh, whether they were uh, Felahin peasants or whether they were, as they subsequently became. Um, landless laborers because they've been forced off the land by 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 zionist settlers um so i'm sure there were <clears throat> honest sincere decent people <clears throat> went for the right reason and i'm sure there were people in 1933 who just 
got on the first ship out of Nazi Germany and uh, and ended up in Palestine. But it, but the whole Zionist project had a, had a, a law of its own, which was to, to to force the Palestinian population off the land. And so, the if if the idea of socialism in one country as big as the Russian Empire it, it was impossible, the idea that it could exist in one little kibbutz is, is just fanciful. I mean, it, it's interesting as well because you know um, there were there were uh, utopian socialists like Robert Owen. Who went off to the United States to set up, um, you know, communal societies, socialistic societies? If you if you ever fancy a really good day out, take yourself off to New Lanark and look at Robert Owen's factory at New Lanark. Um, uh, yes, he was a kind of utopian socialist. Yes, his fact factories were nicer places to work than other people's factories, mm -hmm. but he still took every opportunity to tyrannise over the life of his workers. <laughs> you still. If you if you were late, you'd still get sacked, <laughs> and and ultimately, of course, he he, he was really just um, a, a rather more efficient capitalist for, for being nicer uh, as a utopian socialist. And 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 I'd, you know, I mean, there were instances of uh, of, of kibbutzim that had friendly relations with local villages, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, work, but that didn't stop the stern gangs killing them all. It didn't. It didn't stop the Haganah just driving everybody off the land, and the kibbutz had nothing to do with it. Thank you, um, Satish. Please. I'm sorry. The reason I'd been muting myself was because I've got a bit of a cough, which I'm trying to avoid <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, so I'm going to mute myself again after the question and uh, respond if need be. Uh, there are two questions. The first one is, in your view of uh, Marxism and how it would uh, provide for uh, workers, what happens if you can't work through no fault of your own, through uh, illness or old age, for example? To give an example, there are situations of uh, people who whose football contributed to the independence of their country. They're actually national and African heroes, but they did it 60 years ago. And a lot of them are simply dying because nobody is actually taking the trouble to do anything about it and uh, support them and help them. And the other question <laughs> is uh, in relation to the current situation in Haiti which historically is a country which has been, for want of a better way of putting it, completely betrayed by the international community. It was a revolution which, in the early days, was conducted magnificently and then strangled. Uh, when I say magnificently, part of what I'm talking about is <clears throat> even though they didn't have great the greatest resources, they still spread the influence and they provided assistance in the fight against colonialism and slavery. And it actually played a huge role in the development of uh, the world. For example, the United States would never, ever have become a superpower, or certainly not as quickly as it did, if it hadn't been for the Haitian revolutionaries beating the crap out of uh, Napoleon's tactics and forcing them to sell the Louisiana territories. That resulted in the borders <clears throat> of the, a small country reaching what is uh, what was then Mexico's borders in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, etc. and paved the way for the annexation eventually of California, which was vital. And this played a very, very big part. So I'd noticed Marxists don't, and this is not just at Marxists, this is just about anybody. They don't give credit to the Haitian Revolution and they don't actually look at it and say, well, what do we do about it? Because this kind of example was crushed 
it was made into, <laughs> it's referred to as a failed state. It's not a failed state, direct state. What do you think Marxists should be doing in support of Haiti and uh, it, in terms of understanding <clears throat> the development of countries like that? Because it's quite often forgotten about. Most countries are not as advanced economically uh, as uh, European in, in particular. So if you got a revolution in a country like Haiti, it isn't going to be able to stand on its own. It is going to require assistance. And it is really a good, um, the use of a good example in order to try and hit at uh, the weakest point. Thanks, Conrad. Um, my only knowledge of the, the, the history of Haiti, um, apart from very recent stuff, was actually written by a Marxist, well, a Trotskyist, uh, C.L.R. James, uh, who wrote The Magnificent uh, Black Jacobins. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, C.L.R. James um, wrote a history of that Haitian revolution. Whether that is a good explanation for what we see at the present is a different matter. I mean, as far as I understand it, in more recent times, Haiti has operated under a series of dictatorships that have extracted as much surplus from the country as humanly possible uh, and with the help of the United States and whoever else. I mean, one of the uh, features of um, the, the 80s and 90s in Haiti was, uh, you know, it was a, just a, 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 a place to go for, to, to be exploited, really. Um, so I, as to what socialists should do with the context in the context of something like Haiti, I mean, clearly this is a society which is um, being destroyed, like so many others. I mean, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, and so on. It just it's never ending. I mean, the, the point about capitalism is it is laying waste to to to, to swathes of the world which were once quite well developed. Um, as regards what happens when people can't work, well, they, they support it. Uh, and the idea is, of course, you're moving away, the socialist society would move away from um, commodity production in favour of all production to meet human need. And from that point of view, if you can't work, then you don't have to. Um, it, it, Marx in the critique of the Gotha programme, which we talked about earlier, um, talks about a, a kind of higher phase of of, of communism it's got, it uses communism and socialism in, interchangeably so a, a higher phase of communism you have a, a a situation where um you effectively have from each according to their ability you contribute what you can and to each according to their needs you, you take what you need and so if you have a i mean what we have what do we have at the moment we have um an aging population that are turned into the the basis for for stealing their house uh to to pay for their for their care uh rather rather than be kept in dignity and in in dignity in their own home at the moment they're just simply the the basic basis for exploitation by the care home sector um i don't have a formula for what marxists should say about haiti today i don't think there is a solution that's going to come about by a former colonial power going in, in invading it and taking it back under control. I think the, the working people of Haiti have to do that for themselves. But how you do that in the face of armed militias, um, I mean, as it stands on, the, 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 the current ruler of Haiti was somebody who had been imposed by the West anyway. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they want rid of him. But I don't know enough, really, to say for sure. I I mean, it, does, it does beg the question about sort of revolution in a in a backward country, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about the you know socialism can only exist if it's international. Doesn't mean it has to happen all over the world at the same time. But you kind of need it in a couple of the advanced countries like the US today or or Europe, if you have a revolution in a backward country, it is unlikely to survive, isn't it? I would like, yeah, I would like to think that any 
social any world socialist society would set about many of the underdeveloped parts of the world or parts of the world which have been de-developed uh, by the by the actions of, of imperialist countries um by saying a, a, a version of of, um, of, a, of a development program that would that would reconstitute those those societies and would build up their infrastructure for them um it's quite interesting really in the 1970s i think it was or 60s um uh, doctors and whatever else went from haiti over to zaire uh, uh to to help out there in, in a kind of post-colonial environment um because there was good work to be had and the rest of it um and there's no reason why people couldn't go to haiti personally i find it a bit scary um but 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 that's something that a, a socialist society would have to face there, there are swathes of the world which were once prosperous and and had good educational levels were safe uh, but have been turned into absolute barbarism uh, by the actions of imperialist countries and we would have to reverse that yeah steve please uh, thank you, Tina and uh, Ian. Um, just to take up that point about the blueprint, no blueprint. Um, in a way, no plan for socialism. And, and and I think that was because Marx was rejecting, Marxism was a rejection of the utopian idea that you would think up a blueprint for the most perfect kind of society you'd like to live in. And we'd have, we'd share out the food and we'd do this, that, and the next thing. So we could work on a blueprint and many people could have many blueprints. But Marx wasn't doing this at all. What Marx was doing was something completely different. He was saying, well, socialism grows out of capitalism, out of the development of wage labor. It's the socialization of wage labor. So in a sense, socialism is already happening to us and it's called capitalism, within capitalism. And I know that capitalism, we have exploitation, we have oppression, we have murder, we have genocide. So we can't see the good stuff, the possible future stuff, because all the terrible stuff that's happening to people as, as capitalism develops as an exploitative system. But therefore Marx would say, so Marx would say, well, what would what will capitalism be like in a hundred years time? And he probably couldn't say, so he probably didn't know what socialism would be like in a hundred years time because he, because he couldn't predict that far into the future. But what he could tell us was certain trends that were happening, like the accumulation, like the idea that um, capital is growing larger and larger, businesses are growing, we're, getting, we're going from small businesses to medium-sized businesses, to large, to multinational corporations. Then we're getting automation. Then we're getting um, AI. So we're getting all these things which are all going to be part of the socialization that is taking, that capitalism is doing its work, in that sense, taking us towards it. But the thing to remember, it's not a passive thing that we wait for capitalism to, to socialize everything. It's rather that the working class the struggle of the working class is the propellant of this process. The more the working class is organized, the more it drives this process of the socialization of labor, even if it's because the capitalists have to bring in more machinery to counter the organization of the workforce. And so more and more things become socialized in, 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 in the labor process. So, uh, um, and I think, and I'm, uh, I mean, I'm just thinking of sort of odd things like, I was thinking about these bikes. I don't even have bikes. Maybe you only have them in London and I don't have them anywhere else. But we've got bikes everywhere now. It's kind of the socialization of transport in a way. I know they're privately owned, these line bikes and um, Barclay bikes, but now people rent things. So that's becoming, you know, we could imagine they could be free. They don't have to pay for them. They're privately owned. But we could imagine that our bikes, our cars, our transport easily, easily could be run socially and shared out with the technology we've got how do they know where the bikes are they've all got computer you know they've got computer chips in them so they can track them all down i mean they make possible all sorts of ways of organizing things socially that could not have been done before so that's one thing um 
another thing I wanted to mention, Ian, was I think, and it's very important thing you touched upon, it has to be looked at, I think it's underestimated, the question of productive and unproductive labour. So I think that, uh, and I think that, and it's, I think it's more important to Marxism and to socialist ideas than maybe we, we, we've kind of understood. I, I, I think that it could be that the bourgeoisie has got a theory of productive labour and the working class should have its own theory of productive labour. So we don't just think there's one theory, but maybe there are two theories. But for me, productive and unproductive labour is about that proportion of social production that is wasted, that, go, that doesn't actually go into the production of anything else, that doesn't... Uh, that, now, if you, if you took a hospital, uh, capitalists would say, well, we don't want to waste money on hospitals, that's highly unproductive. But you might argue that having a good healthcare system was absolutely a, an essential part of uh, having a productive economy, keep keeping having a fit workforce, getting the workforce back to work was absolutely essential part of that. And therefore, hospitals are far from being unproductive. They are contributing to the social functioning of our system. Uh, maybe making tanks doesn't do anything for anybody. You know, if we spend m large amounts of money making armaments that don't produce anything at all whatsoever, that surely is waste as well. So anyway, and we can't talk about this now, I guess, because it's a bigger subject in itself, but I think it's a very, very Im important one. And, and I'll finish on this point, um, which goes back to if capital is being socialised, then when you get to the state owning things, that possibly appears to be the highest form of socialisation that can take place, because really, uh, in a in the post office, when we just seen the post office, the post office looks like a publicly owned company owned by us. We're all owning it, but quite clearly we're not. It's operating the post office. We've seen is operating very much like any capitalist organisation in the way it tr treated its workforce recently. So these publicly owned corporations are capitalist corporations like any other exploitative capitalist corporation. I'll stop there. Yes. I'll stop there, Tim. We will be coming on to other points such as productive and unproductive labour, but in brief, I mean, Marx and Engels talked about productive and unproductive labour in terms of surplus value production, uh, as distinct, for example, from finance capital, uh, which in a sense creates no new value, but sucks the value out of the, the productive sector. The, the focus on productive and unproductive labour was a feature of Marx and Engels' concern with the critique of political economy. If you recall, Capital was published as a critique of political economy, and political economy was concerned with questions like, um, what do we mean when we say something has value? What do we mean when we say something is a productive part of the economy as opposed to a non-productive part of the economy? That's why the first couple of chapters of capital are quite difficult because they're about what the commodity is, what's money. Um, because once you get that right, the rest follows. Um, and and uh, once, once you understand what the commodity is, you understand, and you understand how it's the, the labour embodied in the commodity that gives it its value, uh, you start to unlock the, the secret to the difference between productive and unproductive labour. That's because they were having a debate with Adam Smith, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, and so on, um, the classical political economists. Um, but being, if, if you take banking, for example, as something which is non-productive, it doesn't create new value, but it's in fact a parasitic form of capital uh, on uh, what we might call industrial capital. Um, it, it is precisely that. It is a parasitic form of capital. It contributes nothing to, to the, I mean, it might provide very nice salaries for bankers and, and people. We wouldn't want to see ordinary bank workers put out on the street, though. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, in, for example, nationalising the banks without compensation to the bourgeoisie, um, obviously, what we're going to look at then is a, is a collapse in the banking. So the state will have to take it over. But the idea is um, not that the state owns everything that doesn't represent a sort of high point of, of socialism but merely perhaps 
a transitional period until such time uh, as we move to the common ownership of the means of production. So we, we all collectively own uh, our workplace or our workplaces or wherever. Um, uh, there was a, I, I, I was told in the chat, I didn't answer the question about what we do about the disabled, the sick and all the rest of it. They get looked after. We, they, there's no question that um, free health care, free social care would be an intrinsic demand very early on in any socialist society. Um, the other point about it, of course, is uh, the importance of democracy, uh, which is something which is often overlooked in the discussion uh, around what a socialist society is. We think of British society, for example, as supposedly democratic, but of course it's nothing of the sort. You, you, you put your mark of illiteracy on a piece of paper once every four or five years and get a choice between two sections of the, you know, the executive committee of the entire bourgeoisie. Um, instead, what we would have is the kind of direct participative democracy. You know, if, you, if you're going to decide um, what we're going to prioritise in terms of education, health or whatever else, whilst money still exists, then that's put to uh, democratic decisions. And our representatives are subject to recall at any moment um, if, if they don't vote the way we've asked them to vote. Uh, and uh, that would be, a, a, and that was a, a feature of workers' councils, both in the German revolution and of course, the, the Russian word Soviet just means council. Um, and, and was by indication a, a workers' council. So the, we'll come back to the question of productive and unproductive labour because it's sometimes misinterpreted as that somehow socialists are only interested in those bits of the economy that are productive labour. But of course, you end up with a paradox then, don't you? You know, the nurse working in a private hospital is a productive worker in the sense that they're producing surplus value for the capitalist who owns the hospital. But on the other hand, the nurse working in the NHS is employed against taxation rates. That certainly isn't what Marx and Engels were talking about. Um, because the obviously, uh, in order to have a healthy workforce, you, you need a health service, you need good nutrition and all the rest of the, all the other things. Um, uh, and so, so it, it, it isn't about drawing a distinction between, as it were, good workers and not so good workers. It's about, it's about, it's about saying, uh, it was it was about Marx and Engels' critique of classical political economy, uh, but a socialist society you would expect to see health services, education, all the rest of it massively expand uh, uh, at the expense of, for example, the military industrial complex, banking, insurance, finance that makes nothing, uh, and which we wouldn't need anyway because we would be eventually moving to a moneyless economy. Thank you. Um... William is next. You have to unmute. Yeah, okay. There you go. Sorry, I think you muted yourself again, William. I will start on my own okay, muted. Now, now we can hear you, yeah. Right, there's two uh, points I won't be long. We had a communist system in Ireland previous to uh, the Elizabethan invasion. It was known as the Berhan system. A Berhan is a judge. And the Berhan laws were the judges that were the laws that the judges had to uh, adhere to. And they were written down. And we were a land of milk and honey. Uh, production was always in excess. It was always, it's, it's like Ireland is a very fertile country. It has a moderate climate. Uh, it has a very heavy rainfall. And there's no problem in growing anything you want to grow in Ireland. And it's, uh, they, the people live collectively in what was known as clans. Now, people will tell you that the definition of a clan is a family. It's not. It's an extended family. It's, it, there's no English word that actually covers the word clan in the Gaelic language. Now, they also, uh, they lived collectively and there was no such thing as private property. The clan owned the land and the clan administrated the land. Initially, they lived in what was known as uh, Rats, R-A-T-H. And if you travel Ireland or Scotland, you'll find Rat in an awful lot of names on villages and towns. 
and uh, they, they they also then moved on to Clahans. Now Clahan is they tell you is the Irish word for village, which it's not. It's an Irish word for houses that are in a semicircle, and there was always a surplus of houses. It was the responsibility of the clan to make sure there was a surplus of houses. So when people got married, there was a house there for them before they got married and all of that. Now, they also had an education system. Uh, they would uh, educate their children in everything from mathematics to sciences. And it was a very advanced system. Now, in Elizabethan times, they had a thing called Conquer and re -grant. And they would take the land from uh, the clans, give it to an English landlord, and then he would give it back to the clans. But he would also then cream off uh, profits and uh, surplus uh, from the clan. And that, that was the beginning of the end of the, of the communist system. And it was a communist system. People say it was primitive communism. But the more you actually study it, you realize it was advanced communism. Like it was unbelievably advanced. Uh, they also had universities. Uh, you see, Ireland didn't go through. We were never part of the Roman Empire. And because of that, feudalism never took place in Ireland. And that's a major influence uh, and a major, a major difference between Britain and Ireland. We didn't go through feudalism. Scotland also didn't go through feudalism. Now, uh, to, get, to get back to uh, Engels, Engels' woman, Mary Bones, was an Irish woman. She would have came out of that clan system. It was, still would have been an operation because it, when the British uh, banned it and all that, the Irish actually went underground and they, uh, a Frenchman said they were like the snail. When you attack them, they crawl up in, into their shell and they come out. Now, there's lots of uh, literature on uh, how the Irish survived, uh, how the clan system survived even after it was supposed to be obliterated. Yeah, 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 I know. And now, Mary Bones was an itinerant. People say she was illiterate because she didn't, and they also say she wasn't Irish at all because she didn't spell her name the same way as we spell born. She didn't spell her name at all because she was she was illiterate and literacy wasn't universal at the time. And Engels had to modify his whole attitude towards the, and his book, the uh, making his English working class, after she brought him around Ireland and explained certain things to him. He had a big, that had a major influence on him. Now, when she died at the age of 46, he actually went and cohabited with her sister. They were only cohabitees anyway. They never were formally married. Now, she was an itinerant, and in every society, there's always itinerant labour. Like, I was an itinerant when I was a construction worker because construction work is an itinerant industry. Now, she was an itinerant, and uh, itinerants uh, tend to have a little more knowledge and education because of the experience of traveling than people who stay in one place at one time. Now, maybe it's not a lecture on Ireland. Maybe it's do, maybe it's don't, I don't know. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Oh, I would say about Scotland. There's two nations in Scotland, a Celtic nation who also went down with the Bernard system and another nation, which was a feudal nation. There's a, there's a big difference in Scotland. Scotland is not one nation, as far as I'm concerned. They were, um, I, I mean, thank you. I'm always, it's always a pleasure to, to hear from you, William. Uh, and I don't know nearly enough about Gaelic um, land tenures and organisations within Gaelic society. I, I, I know Engels was uh, very interested in it, and so was Marx, and uh, paid a lot of attention to different forms of organising production uh, in, in different societies. Um, of course, capitalism itself subsumes them all. 
it, I mean, the, there are very few places now which have not been subsumed within within capitalism, um, and that's just the point. Even if even if you, we can acknowledge that uh, the whole term of primitive communism is is is, is, is fraught with difficulties, it's not primitive in in a kind of pejorative sense. As I understand it, the German communism is, is is much more like it, more uh, original communism. And uh, but I come back to this point about Marx and Engels not wanting to simply revert to an earlier phase of human development, but take all the advantages of a, of a communal society with 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 direct participative democracy and production to meet human need. And combining that with that which is most technologically advanced, so that we can be f free from the necessity for you know just constantly relying on subsistence, so that we can do so much more, uh, so we can develop ourselves in any way possible, uh, and that and that's just the way. And of course, um, you know, there must be lots of other examples. The, the Native Americans of the of the plains must have had an almost idyllic existence. Before they were slaughtered on mass, and before their food supply was destroyed, but you know that that's the very nature of capitalism. They had a system like the plant system, the Native Americans. It's more natural than than, than what Jews have in your. Uh, I mean, Jews were lords of the manor, lords of the manor, and serfs. The Irish were never serfs. That's why we still have a. a it's very hard to discipline the Irish. <laughs> Because we skipped the stage of history, the simple as that. Okay, thank you. it's also very interesting to read. Interesting to read um, uh, Rosa Luxemburg on this on in national her, her book on national economy, which which does talk a lot about those societies. Russia as well had had a lot of communal living, and she points out that you know that the colonialists went around the world and they found all these different places. You know, eighteenth, nineteenth century even find all these different places where people live together, share everything, and then they all thought, oh, there's something here and there's something there. And it tended to be the rule rather than the exception that before capitalism uh, came about and when feudalism wasn't on the cards, it, it was a, a system where that, that was, you know, natural <laughs> to, to many of these, these communities. Um, John, please, and then or John Tumman first, and then John Fitzgerald. Thanks very much, Tina, and thank you very much, Ian, for a very interesting talk. I uh, missed the first five minutes of it, actually, uh, and I don't know whether you mentioned what I'm about to talk about, but I want to raise something about the brief, I think, f from my point of view, what I heard, brief comments about primitive accumulation. Um because the way that I read this is that before industrial capitalism and in parallel with... Hang on, I'll just have to get the dog in. She's barking like hell. Under socialism, everyone will get a puppy. I promise. <laughs> Any, anyone, who wants, anyone who wants either of my two dogs is very welcome. She's gone out again chasing a cat. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, uh, mercantile capitalism, um, it, it, it started to exist, I, I think, certainly in the uh, Italian states like Venice and the, the Medici developing, uh, as a, a kind of capitalist uh, corporation. Uh, within northern Italy, um, the the um, and and my reading of that merchant capitalism is that it did it didn't develop everywhere in the same uh, at the same time. Um, I mean, in in England, for instance, um, it probably didn't emerge until the very early seventeenth century when you had the replacement of royal charters to merchants, um, favoured merchants by the crown with actual uh, 
everybody was able to go there as merchants and and from that merch, uh, mercantile capitalism developed the triangle of trade and the slave trade uh, silver was discovered in south america brought over from uh, uh the spanish colony new spain from Bogota through the Caribbean and up to Europe, which meant that European countries could buy, uh, could trade with China for the first time, which only accepted silver. And for me, that was a giant, that was the big um, organ of capital accumulation. Um, the capital accumulation that came from the land changing from a feudal to a, a kind of tenant farmer uh, model, I don't I think pales into significance. Certainly if we, if we just look at the uh, at the architectural profile of Liverpool, Bristol, um, Glasgow, and you and you see what was built there by these merchant capitalists, and I I and there was sugar was the first international product as well as slaves, um, coffee, tobacco, all followed potatoes, beans, lots of things which Europe didn't have, um, and those made a lot of money for these merchant capitalists and them and the old aristocracy from i mean where i live there's a lot of history of of the industrial revolution and if you look at the local picture you can see that it was the landowners who became the coal owners it was the landowners who enabled um people uh, like Matthew Bolton and others to build factories uh, and so on um and the banks which had been established as as a result of and because of and because it needed them merchant capitalism they actually um provided investment which was necessary to make this into uh, a real engine of uh of production in a completely different way the capitalist the industrial capitalist system uh, so that that's the way in which i see primitive accumulation and i think this this transfer from non-capitalist societies to capitalist societies i think it is is not possible to understand without talking about imperialism because that's what merchant capitalism was when it comes down to it and and so for me this undoes a lot of the leninist uh understanding which is that capitalism came first and imperialism was what happened in the late 19th century in the early 20th and that was just a stage in capitalism, the latest stage in capitalism. In my view, that is fundamentally wrong. And I'm and people like Victor Kiernan, the uh, contemporary of Hobbesbaum's and and E. P. Thompson have been saying this for a long time, and so have uh, various other people. Um, so you know, I see imperialism as predating capitalism and being a being, if you like, a midwife for capitalism. That's it, Tina. Thank well, you. I really, uh, yeah. I mean, um, Marx and Engels, uh, in talking, I mean, political economy uh, is to economics what jurisprudence is to law. It's the, if you like, the philosophy of economics which is why it's, it's hard to kind of separate the um economics and politics in in marx and and, and, under, and perhaps undesirable to do so um political economy as i say focuses is the philosophy of economics if you will and focuses on those questions fundamental questions what are the productive sectors of the economy and of course there were 
mercantilist writers that argued that, that if you like mercantile capital was the productive sector of the economy similarly the physiocrats were arguing that it's the, the production from land that's the fundamental factor what made adam smith and david ricardo so respected by marx is that smith and ricardo in their own ways both understood that it's actually human labor that adds value to commodities but you're right about mercantile capital and you're right about the italian city-states and so on uh, and the importance of uh, of trade um as part of a, a primitive accumulation but so was the appropriation of land you know the the the, the driving of peasants off the land uh, was a was a, a, a you know, where i live is county durham and you take yourself off to where my mum was from seam harbour uh, lord londonderry um had sizable estates not only in the north of ireland but of course owned much of um durham and northumberland and um and, and that's where his mines were based and that's why seam harbour was built so he could get his coal to 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 market a bit sooner um so absolutely uh and also let's not forget that slavery took a particular form under capitalism okay you know slavery and capitalism don't necessarily go very well together uh, don't go together at all it's anachronism um uh, eric williams uh the for the first uh prime minister of trinidad and tobago wrote a magnificent book called capitalism and slavery where he's arguing that um firstly that triangular trade develops um because of the importance of the world market for sugar uh and of course as you pointed out tobacco and all the other kind of world cash crops um why africans eric williams answer is well they were there uh, they, they were there in su sufficient numbers and uh were likely to survive uh the first people enslaved in the caribbean were the freeborn caribbean people the native people who were there they were very quickly wiped out by european brutality and diseases um and therefore a workforce had to be found and some of their replacements were scottish and irish indentured bondsmen they weren't chattel slaves in the same way but they were more or less slaves indentured bonds, unfree labor by any standards um uh, transported to the west indies uh, to act as a, a, a workforce to grow sugar but couldn't be provided in sufficient numbers and were likely to die from local diseases and it was only africans that that, that made it commercially viable and this of course was the fate of haiti as well haiti was the most prosperous colony that france had and um toussaint de l'ouverture the, the the who led the slave uprising which was finally culminated by dessalines um were inspired by the ideas of the french revolution uh they weren't fools and uh, toussaint de l'ouverture was a was a was a an intelligent man and he was able to understand the, the the concepts of the french revolution and apply it very properly uh to the position of of slaves in haiti um and of course this is magnificently written about by clr james in black jacobins um but yes thank you got one more question and maybe we can even finish by nine uh john i think there's some always something wrong with the camera but you can talk now we can hear you now John Fitzgerald, you can unmute and speak. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, very interested in that discussion. Thanks, Ian. Um, I was thinking, I, it crossed my mind, you know, we have the theory, dialectical materialism, historical materialism, et cetera. And um, it's very difficult to actually imagine a world of socialism, a world of one day, you could say. Um, and it will only come about through working class consciousness. Um, so that's the, you know, there's the kind of dialectic. But the actual whole person, you know, um, Ian, as you say, which I think is... Uh, you know, the fact that we're alienated from ourselves 
as much as that um, we we sell ourselves. So we, whatever we produce, we can't actually use in a whole in a whole way. Yeah. So and then and and then we get theories like the um, the Big Bang theory, for instance. And there's views around that that um, if you're a Marxist, or well, depends. Yeah, if you're saying you're a Marxist and you believe in dialectical materialism. Well, the Big Bang theory is a contradiction as such. So I'm I'm kind of looking at Marx as just on his scientific side. What his the way he way can we call him a scientist in as much as we call other in, you know scientists scientists because nobody seems to they call him a sociologist they call him this they call him that but to, to me I thought for him science was paramount yeah that's it thanks John Ian, perhaps you could answer that question as well with a little bit of summing up of well, your... well, I have to agree with you. Um, of course, Engels wrote about it uh, in Dialectics of Nature. Um, actual proper scientists, when they read Dialectics of Nature, say, well, not really. Uh, I mean, Engels was a, a gifted amateur when it came to, to science, and both Marx and Engels, neither of them know, knew a great deal about natural science or mathematics or whatever, but they knew a bit and quite a lot for their time. Um, the uh, volume one of Capital was to be dedicated to Charles Darwin, um, but um, Marx's friend Wolf died, uh, and so it was dedicated to him instead. Um, Engel, Marx sent uh, volume one of Capital to Charles Darwin in appreciation of his work um, on um, the, the evolution of species by natural selection. Um, uh, they, they were very interested in science. And the other point about it, of course, is that dialectics does apply to nature and not just society. For it to be otherwise would be rather strange, wouldn't it? It would be to suggest there are two separate substances, societies which kind of exist as some kind of fuzzy thing that has dialectics going on and big lumps of rock which don't. But that's simply not true, is it? I mean, what we see, particularly with something like plate tectonics, is that the whole Earth is in constant movement, in constant um, upheaval. Uh, in you know, the geological time is considerably longer, but nevertheless, everything comes into being and dies away. Uh, whether it's planets, whether it's stars, or whatever else, I don't know. I think. My 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 highest qualification in physics is CSE grade three, which I think broadly speaking means I've got my name and candidate number in the right box. So I don't purport to uh, know anything apart from, you know, watching Brian Cox on the telly or whatever. Um, but as I understand it, planets too come and go. This is what we see, and what we see is a kind of dialectical movement in physics and. You know, if take the simplest thing, um, the positive and negative charges of an atom seem very dialectical to me somehow. Um, but again, I, I'm not a physicist, and I wouldn't uh, presume to to speculate on it. What I would say is, um, dialectics has been treated as something of a dead dog uh, by uh, Stalinism and. And, and an assortment of others who would be um, uh, want to be critics of Marx who, who, who don't trouble themselves to, to read it very well. Um, d d dialectics was at the heart of everything they did, uh, and they tried to in, and they tried to understand it both in terms of the physical world as well as the coming into being and uh, supersession of, of, of societies in history. Um, and you're right about them seeing themselves as scientists, above all, as, as having a scientific approach to history. Um, if you say science and history in the same breath in English, um, it 
it doesn't sound right because we tend to see things in empiricist terms. That's part of the whole history of uh, of English science of imperial of empiricism, um, where you really just see cause and effect, and and there isn't the same movement. Um, by contrast, uh, it was explicable in terms of law governed motion. The fact that England English doesn't even have a verb for for law governed motion really, unless anyone can think of one. In Russian, is zakonomiernost, and in other, I'm sure in German there is one as well. Um, but it's an interesting feature of, uh, of of the influence of empiricism on the English language that we don't. Uh, so, how I would sum things up is to say that. Um, Marx and Engels were putting forward a science, not just of society, but uh, a science of the coming into being and ultimate supersession of capitalism. Their work was largely concerned with a critique of political economy. Uh, and they weren't usually concerned with um, blueprints, blueprints from what a socialist society would be like. But what they were concerned was with how human beings have developed in history uh, and ultimately will be truly human in a socialist society. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ian. A very um, wide ranging discussion. And maybe in the next session, you speak a bit slower in your introduction. There was a lot packed in in a very short amount of time, but it's it's really good to get all, you know, philosophy, economy, um, politics, all in one um, a session. That's very unusual. And it, I think it worked very well. Thank you for preparing that. We're back in two weeks with another session of ABC of Marxism. Next week, we're back with the Communist Culture Club, where we're going to discuss questions like uh, George Orwell. Should we reject him just because the right love him? We're also going to take a look at Dune, that uh, new film from a communist perspective. And we're going to look at Intifada. The Intifada will be cultural with Tamdine Byrne, the actor. Good night.